This is the review for the Chapter 4 Electrons Test. If you are watching the video at home, it may be in your best interest to pause the video, write each slide, and then listen to the uh, lectures as, as I explain it because this is going to go kind of fast. All right. Those of you that are in here watching this as we talk, one of the main things we talked about whenever we talked about light is we said it, had, it travels in two ways. What were the two ways that it travels? A wave or a particle. Let's focus on one way right now. We're going to talk about frequency and wavelength. We're going to talk about waves. So frequency is the number of waves that pass a given point in a given amount of time. A given point in a given amount of time. So if I have a wave that's traveling with this frequency, how can I increase it? So, but here's the issue. Given point in a given time. We have this thing called a hertz. Hint, hint, wink, wink. Know what a hertz is. Know what a hertz is. A hertz is one wave per second. Now, here's the problem with the fact uh, or the concept of a hertz. Does anyone know what unit, or excuse me, what prefix is applied to hertz normally in the real world? Say that again. Megahertz. Very good. What does the prefix mega turn it into? A million. So a megahertz would be what exactly? One million what? Waves per second. Do you agree that is a lot of waves in one second? A lot. How does that make sense logically? How fast are these things traveling? At the speed of light. So that's why they're normally measured in megahertz. If something is traveling at the speed of light, which FYI, you need to know that number. You need to have it memorized. We'll talk about it in a second. Uh, you can understand why so many of these things pass a point in a given second. There's no way I can make a million claps in a second. I'm not that good. So that's what I need you to understand about wavelength. Now, what is the symbol for, excuse me, about frequency? What is the symbol for frequency? New. Very good. N-U. And it kind of looks like a funky looking V, right? Thank you, Seth. Okay. Now, these two waves that I have, uh, this orange wave and this blue wave right here, do you agree that the wavelength, how long those waves are apart, are the same? Okay. Well, we hadn't talked about wavelength, so let's talk about wavelength. So, wavelength is a symbol of what? Lambda. Okay. And the definition of wavelength is the distance between two corresponding points on a wave. Now, there's two points on a wave. What are the two points? Crest to crest or trough to trough. So, we have a crest to crest or trough to trough. Again, I'm not a perfect drawer. But if I were, my crest to crest would be the exact same distance as my trough to trough. This is something you will not be required to know on the test. But amplitude. What is amplitude? It's the height of the wave. Okay, The height is from the midline to the top of the wave. Now, here's the thing I want to make a point of. If I take the amplitude from the midline to the crest, should it be the exact same from the midline to the trough? Yes, it should be the exact same. So, again, the amplitude should be the exact same no matter, where you, no matter which way you go up or down. Now let's go back up to the top. This red line, or this orange line, and this blue line, they have the same wavelength, right? They're the same distance apart. What is the difference in the orange and the blue line specifically? The amplitude is different. One's really, really short. One's really, really tall. We don't get into this in chemistry. This is physics. If you ever take physics, Seth, you on that yet? Have you all done this yet? That's right, you're not in physics. Uh, my bad, I thought you were. So again, this is something you'll do in physics. That's compressional waves. That's right, that's Parker. So again, that is frequency and wavelength. Now, one of the other, if you look at your second test objective, or the second little sub-bullet, it says know how the two are related. Frequency and wavelength are indirectly related, which means what? One goes up, the other goes down. So from A to B, what happened to my wavelength? It get smaller or shorter? It got smaller or shorter? It's a trick question. It's the same answer. Did it get longer or shorter? From wave A to wave B, wavelength is lambda. 
it got shorter. Now listen. So if I'd make this wave move from A to B, if my wavelength got shorter, what happened to my frequency? It went up. So do you agree that more peaks would pass the point in a given second? Yes. Trick question. Which wave's traveling faster? Neither. They're going the same speed. Do not. I told you it was a trick question. Some people still yelled out the wrong answer. Okay. Make sure that you know this. Now, again, they're traveling at the same. And it even said, speeds are the same. Wow, okay. Now, make sure you know that number. 3.0 times 10 to the 8 in the unit is meters per second. I'm telling you now, know that number. Now, there are three math problems on this test. At the very last three, 48, 49, and 50. You're going to have to know how to do these. C equals lambda nu. We know lambda is wavelength. We know frequency is, uh, excuse me, nu is frequency. C is what? Don't say constant. It's the speed of light, speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8. So this is important that we know this. Okay. Now, there is one thing I actually want to add. This is going to be the unit triangle. Okay. You just told me the speed of light has what unit? Meters per second. Do you agree? Wave length should be in what? Meters. Frequency. This is the funky one. Remember, frequency is seconds to the negative 1, which is really what? 1 over S. So if you look down there in that bottom blue triangle, if you have M times 1 over S, what should your unit be? M over S, which is exactly what we have on top. Okay, do you all see that? So that is that. All right, E equals H nu. What does E stand for? What should your energy unit be? Joules, very good. Joules should be your unit of energy. Okay? Planck's constant. Do you have to memorize that for the test? No, I'm going to give it to you, and here it is, just in case you do want to memorize it. 6.626 times 10 to the negative, negative 34th joules times seconds, J times S. Okay? J times S. We know frequency is what? 1 over S, right? So let's think for just a second. If I multiply J times S times 1 over S, what happens to your units? What cancels? Seconds cancel, leaving you with what? Is E, J. There you go. Mass should prove. Mass should work. You with me? Okay. Another fact to know. Energy and frequency are directly related. Okay. The slide you're going to see in just a second talks about long waves and gamma waves. Which wave has more energy? Gamma rays. You don't want to be hit by a gamma ray. So, do you agree that if gamma has a really high energy, do you agree that it's hitting you a lot more often? That if it has high energy, it's hitting you a lot, right? What's the difference between a Category 1 and a Category 5? Hurricane is what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. So Category 5 hurricanes are very destroying. There's a lot of energy. How often do the, the waves hit the beach? Very frequently, right? So that's kind of how that works. So if you increase the frequency, the more energy you have. Here is the formula, E over H nu. Let me talk to you a second about the mass. So let's, talk, let's say that the question states, the wavelength is this number. What is the frequency of the wave? Which formula would you use? Hang on one second. Let me, let me repeat this. The wavelength is this number. The question is, what is my frequency? Which one would you use? This one right here. How would you solve for frequency? I need this, right? So it's C. So you would take the speed of light, which is the number you need to know, 3 times 10 to the 8, divided by the number that I gave you for lambda. Okay? We good there. All right, here's the question. What if I say the frequency of a wave is this? What is the amount of energy? Which formula would you use? The only one with energy. E equals H nu. Take the value that I gave you. Multiply it by Planck's constant. Will you have this number on the test? Yes. So multiply them. You'll get your value of energy. This is the one you really need to listen to. This is the one that's going to get you if you're not paying attention. What if I tell you that the 
wavelength is a certain number. First of all, which value am I talking about, or which variable? I'm talking about this one right here. For those of you on the video, I'm talking about this one right here. If I give you lambda, and then I say, what's my amount of energy? What do I have to do? I got to find frequency first. And once I have frequency, what can I then do? Can I then plug it into here and find E? You with me? Okay, let's flip the script. What if I tell you that I have a wave that has this much energy? What's its wavelength? First of all, I gave you E, right? What do I need? I need lambda. Okay. Well, how do I get to lambda? I got to find nu first, and then once I find nu, what do you do? Plug it in over here. Do you see what we're doing? We're just using both formulas there. Yes, sir. I'm not giving you the formulas. The only thing I'm giving you is Planck's constant. That's it. That's all I'm giving you. You got another formulas. Huh? Yeah. All right, next. Next slide. Again, this is the electromagnetic spectrum. This is treating light as a wave. As we go left to right, do you agree that wave is getting closer and closer and closer and closer? So what's happening to my wavelength? It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. What's happening to my frequency, the amount of times it passes a point? It's going up and up and up and up and up. Which wave would you rather be in the ocean with, the left side or the right side? Left. So this tells me this has less or more energy. Way less energy, right? Where's the mo most energy? On the right side. That's your category five going over there. But that's hurricanes. We need to talk about light, the electromagnetic spectrum. So you have long waves, then you have TV radio, microwaves, infrared, and what's this VL? Visible height. This is the only part that we can see with our eyeballs. Remember Roy G. Biv? No, it's Roy G. Boom. Okay, he lost his eye. I said that I said that earlier. Somebody said somebody poked his eye out. I was like, oh my gosh. Like legit, they thought someone poked his eye out because I said he lost his eye. No, no, we're not going there. But that would, but, but, very plausible, very plausible. Okay. And then after visible light, we get in the ultraviolet range, X-rays, gamma rays. And so that is your visible light spectrum. Again, the thing at the bottom is the most important. As your wavelength decreases, your frequency and your energy increase. Okay? All right. Moving on to the next one, a quantum. Remember, a paintball is not a paintball without paint. A photon, which I'm going to talk about next, a photon is not a photon without a quantum. A quantum. So what is a quantum? Now, a quantum is a numerical measurement. I can quantify it. I can put an exact amount to it. It's a minimum amount of energy that must be gained or lost to move energy levels. Well, let's pause right there. It must. It's a minimum that must be gained or lost. Can you gain half a quantum? Can you lose half a tooth? No, it's all or nothing. You gain it or you lose it. You don't do half. You don't do quarters. You don't do anything else but either you get it or you don't get it. Okay, now let's talk about this gain or loss thing. If you are on the ground, what would I have to give you to get you to the roof? <laughs> Y'all are so literal sometimes. Energy, thank you. <laughs> you. You have to have energy still go up the ladder? Yeah, so we're cool there. All right, so you still have to have some type of energy to get from the ground to the next level. So if an electron wants to go from the ground level state to the next energy level, what's it going to have to gain? Some type of energy. But what is that energy in an electron called? A quantum. You with me? So it's got to gain a quantum. Now, what is the actual vocabulary term for when something is gained? Absorption, that means to take in. So when you take in that quantum, when you take in that energy, you can jump up energy levels. When an electron jumps up, we call it excited. Okay? If you were on the roof of the school, would you be pretty excited? I would. It'd be kind of cool if nobody else gets up on the roof. Okay? So you'd be excited. So when you go from ground state to excited state, you go up energy levels. Now, at the same token, if you gain that amount of energy, do you eventually have to get back down? Yes, you're either going to get down the ladder, somebody's going to push you off. 
Okay, so here's the deal. So if you want to get back down, what do you have to do with that energy? You got to get rid of it. You got to lose it. So what is the vocabulary term for an electron losing that quantum? Emission. Yes, I know I misspelled it two different ways. Okay, so, but here's the important aspect of when you give that energy off, in what form does it give it off in? It gives it off as light, and we know when you give off light, it's called a photon. So you're starting to see those dynamic connections there. Okay, that's what, that's what I'm hoping you're going to see. Because now we need to transition and talk about exactly what a photon is. Um, make sure I'm good here. I just want to make sure I don't want to talk about anything else. Okay, so a photon is this. Hint, hint, wink, wink. It was proposed by Max Planck. Okay, Max Planck was the guy that first really introduced the terms of the uh, concept of a photon. Einstein mathematically theorized it, and Max Planck was really one of the guys that proved it. Okay? So, photon is a packet of light carrying a quantum of energy that what? That can be gained or lost. Okay? Again. A photon is a packet of light carrying a quantum of energy that can be gained or lost. Now again, I told you this a minute ago, this massless concept is actually referring to the photon itself. This is why it's so weird. What is the definition of matter? Anything that has mass and takes up space. This is, so is it matter? Is it? Without it, would we have life? That's 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 a tough concept right there. Okay, that's a tough concept. Without light, we would not have. Without light, we would not have life. But light isn't matter. But everything else is. That's the real meaning of life. That's philosophy at its finest. See, that's a great question. I don't know. I, like that's one of those Einstein things that's just so far away up here mentally that I don't even think they know. All right. Okay. All right. Photoelectric effect. Let's pause right there and let's talk about what this means. What does the prefix? Let's change color. What does the prefix photo mean? Light. Electric means electron. So it's the effect that light has on an electron. That's amazing. So here's what we're going to talk about. What is Fe? Iron. So here's what we're going to do. Iron is a piece of metal. Do you agree? So what kind of bond is holding that metal together? A metallic bond. Wow. Okay. Now, we're going to learn about metallic bonds in Chapter 6, but a metallic bond has something special about it. A metallic bond has something called a sea of electrons. And what does that mean? It means the electrons can float and float and go anywhere they want. If I take you to the Gulf of Mexico and put you in a ship, can you go anywhere you want to go? Yeah, if I take an electron and I put it in a sea of electrons, can it go anywhere it wants to go? That's the concept. So here's what's happening. We know that electrons can gain photons. Right, Tanaya? All right, thank you. So we know that an electron can gain a photon, which is a quantum of energy. If I walk down to the baseball field and I hit a baseball, do you agree that there is a minimum amount of required energy for me to hit the ball over the fence? Yes. If I hit it over the fence in a game, is that a great thing? Yes. So do you agree that there would be a specific required amount of energy to knock an electron out of the park? And what I mean by the park? The park I'm talking about is the atom itself. Okay? If you knock an atom out of the park or electron out of the park, do you agree you've knocked it off of the atom? Off the atom. Do I, if I hit the ball out over the fence, that's out of the park, right? If I hit an electron with a certain amount of energy, it'll knock it out of the atom. It is, but you can knock it completely off. Completely and totally off. Like, I mean, flying through space. Okay? Yes, it, basically, you knock it out of the bond. Okay? So here's what's going to happen. Let me, let me see if this fixes it. Okay? Do you agree that photon has energy? When you hit it with a certain amount of energy, it knocks that electron off, and here's what's going to happen. What's the charge of an electron? Negative. A cathode is positive. What, is, do, what do positives and negatives do? Attract. So this negative is going to go to this positive cathode, right? What's that electron going to do? It's going to run down the wire. It's going to go to this light bulb. What's going to happen? It's going to turn on. Okay. So if we have a specific amount of energy that hits this piece of metal, we can knock electrons off of it. Now, do you agree if I hold a flashlight to a piece of iron, it's going to happen? 
No. Is there enough energy in that flashlight? But what if I hit it with an x-ray? Is it possible then? Yeah, absolutely it is. However, if it were possible with an x-ray, would they give you lead vest? No, that wouldn't make sense because your chest would be glowing. Think about that. Think about that. Photoelectric effect. Microwaves hit lead. Electrons show off. Yeah. But, so it doesn't happen. you got to have a little more energy than an x-ray. So that's what's going on here. So that is how the photoelectric effect works. So when light hits a metal, the metal gives off an electron. The photon causes the electron to be knocked off. This can create a source of current, and so the light bulb turns on. Okay? Now, line emission spectrum. So line emission spectrum, when gases give off certain colors through their prism, this was the lab we did. Remember when we cut the hydrogen tube on, what color did it turn? With the eyeballs? It was purple, but when you put the glasses on, was it purple anymore? It separated out, hint, hint, wink, wink. You need to know line emission spectrum is the spectrum that gases give off. Hydrogen specifically gave off how many? Four, very good. All right, we close to being catching back up because we're running out of time. All right, Bohr, right or wrong? Wrong, boring Bohr. He said they traveled in orbits like planets. That's wrong, okay? Just real quick, throwing this at you, this little purple circled E that I have, could it be right there? No, that's wrong. Why can it not be there according to Bohr's model? Is it on the right path? No, does, does the Earth sometimes fly out there and hang around with Jupiter? No, it always stays on its de defined path. On a good day it might, yeah, you're right, okay? Ground state versus excited state, really important. Ground state, the lowest total energy of an electron is closest to the energy. So if you're standing on the ground, do you agree that you're closest to the Earth? That's your lowest state of matter, your lowest state of energy. The excited state is the change in an electron when it absorbs energy and moves up energy levels. So how do I get you on the roof? You got to jump. You got to get energy. Okay? All right. Uh, hang on. These guys. So I'm going to pause the video. Let y'all catch this up. Go. All right. So three guys, the Broly, Schrodinger, and Heisenberg. Very important things you need to know about these guys if you're, if you're going along with the slides. De Broly, he said electrons travel like waves and particles. Very important that you understand that. Hint, hint, wink, wink. De Broly, waves and particles. Okay? Confined to a space around the nucleus. Well, here's where it started transitioning from Bohr to different models. Well, then Heisenberg and Schrodinger showed up. Heisenberg stated, you cannot know the position or the velocity of an electron at a given point. Now, we know that we, we know the speed of an electron. What's the speed of an electron? Speed of light. So here's the concept. Why do I not know the velocity? Because a velocity has a vector. It has an angle. It has a direction. If I told you I'm driving 60 miles an hour, come find me. What direction do you drive? Because if I'm driving south and you're driving north, guess what? You're never going to find me. But if I tell you that I'm driving south, if my direction is negative, if my direction is positive, if I'm at a certain angle, you can define that. And then Schrodinger showed up with this crazy, crazy math equation that depicted electrons like waves. Okay, listen. So they're like waves now. This is what you need to grasp. These two guys, Heisenberg and Schrodinger, from the concept of the position and the idea of waves and particles, Schrodinger's math developed the concept of the orbital. Very crucial that you understand what an orbital is. Okay? Now, this is another thing. Hit, hit, wink, wink. As the distance from the nucleus increases, what happens to the amount of energy? It goes up. So if you're on the fourth floor and I push you off of the building, are you going to hit with more energy than first floor? Yes. Bottom line, that's how that's going to work. Next slide. All right. Principal angular magnetic and spin. The little red looking letters underneath each word is its symbol. You're going to see these symbols. You need to know them. Just like if I ask you, what is the letter for gram? G, what's the letter for Fahrenheit? F, what's the letter for enthalpy? H, what is enthalpy? Well done. Principal is just the letter N. Principal quantum number is the energy level. You need to know the word energy level, but it's also going to be in reference to the period. What is the lowest possible energy level there is? 1s. Always start at the 1s. We're going to talk about why that's true in a few minutes. Angular. That's the shape. The shape refers to the block. Yes? Angular. Shape. Block. S, P, D, and F. Those are your three or your four. Magnetic. Orientation. 
the orbital. Here's something you can write about this, the uh, magnetic orientation. This is the bed in the room. Does that make sense? No, it's which bed? It's not how many, it's which bed. Okay? So spin, of course, spin up, spin down. Very common sense. Okay? That's your quantum numbers. Do you have to do the quantum numbers on the test? No, you see, there are these definitions. You don't have to. Def you don't have to give me the address. You got to know how to explain the address. Okay? No. Magnetic. Which bed in the room? Again, one possible shape for the S because it's a sphere. But the P block has how many shapes? Three shapes because it has three axes. So if we're looking at two P, do you agree that it has an X, a Y, and a Z axis? Well, there's your axes. But remember, how many electrons can each one of these things hold? Okay, so the possible shape, so we can hold, well, all right, so we can have an electron here and an electron here. So how many total electrons can we pile onto these? We can have six total electrons, right? So six electrons can show up on this thing. Now, there's five shapes for D and seven shapes for F, but we don't ever have to know about those. These are your shapes. Know them, live them, breed them. Okay? Uh, this is important. This is the concept that I haven't really done a whole lot of talking about, and I really want to get this in before the other bell. Period one. Do you agree that that's row number one? There are only two elements in that entire period. What are those two elements? Hydrogen and helium. The only two in this thing are hydrogen and helium. Therefore, do you agree that the total number of electrons you can have in that entire row is two? Okay. When we're on the second row, do you agree that we have an S block and a P block? Okay. If you're not quite sure what I'm talking about, real quick, just bounce into it. Pull this up. I can go to here. Okay. Change this. So we're talking about this and this. The question is how many electrons are in the second period? How many are here? That's two. And then how many over here? Six. So how many total? Eight. What about the third row? One, two. How many total? Eight. Be very careful. Do not count the D block yet. Why? Because D is technically with which row? It's technically with row four, but we label it as row three. Okay? So now we have how many? There's two in the S. How many in the D? 10 in the D, and how many in the P? So how many total? 18. That's how many total electrons are in each period. So that's where this corresponds to. And if you did the four, you'd have the 14 Fs to deal with as well. Okay? Now, these are our numbers of orbitals. Now, again, the orbitals are kind of like the beds. So the S has one orbital, but one orbital can hold how many electrons? Two electrons. So how many electrons can be in the S orbital? Two total electrons. You with me? P has three beds. Each bed can hold how many? Two. So how many total electrons? Three orbitals, two electrons apiece, six total. D has five orbitals, two electrons apiece. How many total electrons? 10 and F, we don't ever worry about. But that's, does that make sense? Am I going a little too quick for this? All right. Um, last slide. Off ball, Polly, and Hund. Off ball. This is the guy I call the roller coaster. How do you fill a roller coaster? Front to back. So you fill it from lowest to highest. Where do you always start? Always start with your 1S. Okay. Polly. This is the address guy. Can't have the same address, but we don't call them addresses in chemistry. What do we call them? Quantum numbers. Electrons cannot have the same four quantum numbers as any other electron. Remember, we defined those. We talked about what those were. And then Hund's rule is space the electrons out in different orbitals if there is room. So instead of, like if we have three orbitals, would I bunch them up like that? What's wrong with that? 
there's an empty orbital, we got to fill it up first. We got to put at least one in each one. All right, the last bullet on your test objectives, and I'm not going to take the time to do, but I will send you a video out. If you want to watch it, it's for you. I'm not going to take it up for a grade. If you just need extra help with the orbitals and all that stuff, uh, the very last bullet says know how to do orbital notation, electron configuration, and noble gas configuration. So again, that video, I think it's 12, 18 minutes long, so somewhere in there, uh, and that's how that's going to work. So again, that's it for the chapter review.